Okay, so today we're going to be talking about a little bit about my work and also about how the game experience with the Externalities game relates to a larger scale collective action problem such as climate change. So here's a figure that I've created that I think describes the climate change externality problem pretty well. So along the x-axis, you see the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere increasing in parts per million. On the y-axis, you see increasing damages to ecosystem services. So the idea is as CO2 increases, you see resulting increases in temperature, see in each column here, which results in more costs uh, or more damages to our ecosystem services. And you see some examples of these externalities that are expected to result from these increases in temperature. You can also see that the relationship is exponential. This is because there's a lot of feedback mechanisms within the climate system that aren't linear. So there's certain things that lead to other things, that lead to greater results in other things. Um, and we don't really know where thresholds lie. So we don't know where we're going to get to the point where we can't fix the problems that are occurring. Um, as of, I guess this was a few weeks ago, we were about here, 396 parts per million which is pretty consistent with some of these um, expected results that we're seeing or impacts around the world. So this is like the scientific view, right? This is like the natural science view. It shows some of the damages or externalities associated with climate change. But it doesn't really say much about the moral implications, I guess. So here's another figure that I use in my research. Now this shows CO2 emissions, not the concentration, but this is emissions in tons per capita or per person. Each bubble is a different country. The size of the bubble is relative to the population of that country. Along the y-axis is human, the Human Development Index. If you're unfamiliar with this index, it's a composite index. It has parameters in it uh, with health, education, and also income. So it takes those three parameters, takes averages, normalizes it on a scale from zero to one, and it allows you to compare and rank countries in terms of human development. So in general, we see, right, as CO2 emissions per capita increase, we also see increases in human development. But we also see this sort of saturation effect or diminishing returns. Basically, it's a fancy way of describing countries here receive huge increases in human development for small increases in CO2, where countries located in this area of the graph can increase their CO2 emissions almost as much as they want without really seeing an impact in CO2. A lot of this is because uh, extra emissions now in the developed world aren't things that are contributing to greater educational experiences, better health, um, and so these are mostly what you would call maybe luxury emissions. So there's a lot of moral implications from this. It sort of has the, it suggests that countries here should be able to reduce their CO2 emissions to a point, maybe, you know, in this area, where they are emitting much less carbon but receiving about the same level of human development. So it sort of says that, you know, these uh, ideas where, oh, if we reduce our emissions enough, we're going to return to the Stone Age or something. No, we can reduce it pretty far without really seeing a huge decrease in our quality of life, at least defined by the Human Development Index. By doing that, we would then allow countries here to be able to increase their emissions. And basically, we'd end up, ideally and conceptually, overall, with everyone with sort of at least living at sort of a minimum standard of living worldwide. And if you think about the curve I showed on the first slide, so it's this exponential, almost damage function, and the saturation effect of our well-being or human <coughs> development curve of CO2, it's pretty much how we structured the externalities game. So you can see similar curves here. And as you know, uh, in this class, your grade is determined sort of by subtracting the units that you produce minus the, your sort of share of those externality points that everyone produces. So reminder, right now we have potential of 137 players. Again, there may be some absentees, so maybe it's much less. Three roles, as we know, we have luxury producers, intermediate, and subsistence and three classrooms. So now let's take another look at this graph. So you can put sort of these universities on this map. And you know, RIT and ASU can interchange this, it's not supposed to mean anything. But 
I think by looking at it from this perspective, you can really see how the game is supposed to simulate a problem like climate change. So first, development level, which could be access to resources. We know that Mountain Liberty University has limited uh, ability to communicate with us because they don't have you know, uh, reliable internet or reliable electricity. Their phones are working pretty well, but we know the Twitter system failed, right? So what they have avail to, available to them in terms of resources, but also you can take it more literally in terms of human development, right? Their education, uh, income, um, education, income, and health, right, are going to be much lower in general than students at ASU and RIT. So you can also think about it, roles, and we brought this up before, we have three different roles in each class. So in a way you can think about that as like classes within a country. So you have the upper class, the middle class, the lower class, for example. That can correspond to luxury, intermediate subsistence. So that's another way you can think about it. Also population. So in our class we have 26 players, RIT has 23. Potential of 88 here pretty much corresponds to the type of populations we're looking at in developed versus developing countries as a whole. Okay, so now I'm going to get into the paper a little bit. The assignment that we've asked you to do, which I just went over, I'm going to admit it, it's going to be a little bit challenging, I think. Um, so what I'm going to do is run through the paper a little bit, and then you guys can read it on your own. And by that time, I think you'll be much more ready to answer some of these questions. So first, we'll clarify some terms. And you'll see these in the paper. Uh, Annex 1 countries, basically, basically a group of industrialized countries. And they use these terms a lot uh, in the international level of climate policy. UNFCC is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. It should be another C, it should be three Cs actually. Um, so Annex 1 is just a way to identify sort of the industrialized countries of the world. Annex 2 is just a small subgroup of Annex 1 countries. And these are like the most developed countries of the world. Um, they include the OECD countries. Um, so the democratic group of countries, but they exclude some of the economies in, tr in transition that are also in Annex 1. Then you have your third group, basically non-Annex countries or the developing countries. Now under the Kyoto Protocol, only the 29 most industrialized countries of the world are um, subjected to uh, greenhouse gas targets, so reducing their emissions to a certain amount. Developing countries are exempt under Kyoto, they don't have to worry about reducing emissions. Um, and actually Kyoto is coming to an end this year, and there's a new sort of proposal that's coming about now, and those details are being figured out. But sort of this is sort of the state of, state of things when Jameson wrote his paper. So keep that in mind. Um, and Jameson will talk about the view from above. In general, he's talking about the Annex One countries. He talks a lot about this perspective from the United States in the paper, but in general it's supposed to represent all developed countries. The view from below is then from the developing countries' point of view. It's also important to understand the difference between these two terms. Um, in climate policy and in uh, talking about justice in terms of climate policy, you'll see these terms appear, and basically distribution is Establish, establishing property rights. So who has the permission? Who morally should be allowed to have the right to emit? But then there's actually allocation, which kind of comes after distribution. There may be an additional uh, system like a market, a cap and trade system, for example, that, actually, that allows trading or the transfer of these permits for exchange for money, for example. So distribution is like the initial allotment who has the right allocation is really who's actually ends up emitting at the end. So it's important to keep those uh, terms separate. All right. Now, Jameson starts his essay talking about sort of the skepticism that we have with climate science. And this is important because if you don't think climate change is a problem or that it's causing harms for anyone, then you don't think that you, know, you have a moral obligation to about it, right? So if the science is skeptical, then you can say, well, it's not really happening, I don't have a responsibility, I don't have to do anything about it. So it's important to keep this in mind. Um, I don't know if you guys remember the climate scandal or like climate gate that happened a few years ago. 
Um, raise your hand. Do you guys know what happened in ClimateGate? Some of you. So basically, there was a server that was hacked and emails between a few scientists at um, climate, small climate research centers um, were stolen and read through. And there was maybe a handful of emails that were pulled out and specific sentences that were extracted, put in the media, and it basically made it seem like the warming trends that these scientists found were manipulated. You know, they were changing the data, and I think it's temperature trends and also tree ring data to make it look like there's a warming when there really wasn't. Um, and if you read into it, you can actually see the you know, paragraphs that these sentences were taken from, and it really had nothing to do with manipulating temperature trends or whatnot. Um, so, but something like this, right, can make people question, is climate change really happening? Maybe it's just a hoax. Maybe these scientists are just doing this to make money. They need funding, right? So they're making up a problem to get money. So if people believe that, that will reduce the type of moral or ethical considerations that we have in thinking about climate change. Also, there's this argument, ought implies can. So if I can't do something, I can't be responsible for doing it, if that makes sense. So we can't fly. I can't have a moral obligation to fly. Cats can't be vegetarian. I actually don't know if that's true, but I guess maybe they can't. Um, so you can't expect them to be vegetarian if they can't be. Um, and so this, in terms of climate change, this is an example you see a lot. People can't be expected to reduce their necessary emissions. You shouldn't be expected to stop driving to work if you need to go to work to get income. Maybe you would be expected to drive a more fuel-efficient car, or maybe you should be expected to turn on your thermostat at home, but you know, not feeding yourself or not doing the things that you actually need to do to, to survive. Um, you can't be ethically responsible you know, for doing those things. And also, this type of argument equates to this idea, well, if we can't do it politically, then it's just impossible. So this is some of the things that come out when the US says, we can't reduce our emissions because it's going to hurt us economically. That's political will. That's not like we can't do it, right? So those are different arguments. Um, finally, uh, this is a lot like the first one. So the credibility. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, it's viewed by a lot, by like this great effort, all these scientists coming together, trying to do good for the world. You know, they looked at it as sort of authority on climate change and environmentalism. But from the developing country's point of view, it's a group of scientists that come from the developed world. It seems kind of like an inclusive group. A lot of the expertise about climate change tend to come from that area, true, but they feel have a difficult, in some respects, um, being able to trust what scientists say in the developed world. So there can be these trust issues that go on that you wouldn't necessarily think of um, from just an American point of view, for example. And developing countries know that American citizens question climate change. So they say, okay, some of the world's greatest experts about climate change come from America, but most of America, not most, a lot of Americans don't believe in climate change. So what does that say? Those are some thoughts that I'm sure a lot of people in the developing countries have, and it doesn't help with ethically taking you know, a moral um, reasoning to deal with climate change. 